Uh, welcome to GRIPS Forum. My name is Yusuke Takagi, a faculty of GRIPS, and uh, this is a GRIPS Forum uh, with Ambassador Bilahari Kausekan. It's a great honor for me to serve as a moderator today. And uh, uh, before starting, uh, let me introduce our uh, speaker today. Ambassador Bilahari Kausekan is a currently chairman of Middle East Institute, an autonomous institute of the National University of Singapore. And before, he has spent his entire career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Singapore. And during his 37 years in the ministry, he served in a variety of appointments at home and abroad, including as ambassador to the Russian Federation, permanent representative to the UN in New York, and as a permanent secretary to the ministry. And actually, I like the last line of your CV. Uh, Ruffles Institution, University of Singapore, and Columbia University in New York or attempted to educate him. And I do not know if their attempts succeed or fail, but I'm sure we will be educated by him today. So uh, without further ado, uh, let us invite Ambassador Bilahari. Ambassador Bilahari, screen is now yours. Thank you. Uh, I must begin by thanking the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies for, for inviting me to talk to this GRIPS forum. I also want to thank uh, Professor Ono, you, Professor Takagi, for moderating this event, and Professor Shimoda and Dr. Brahma for participating in it. And of course, I must not forget to thank Ms. Chigiri for her hard work in making the arrangements for me to participate. But time is limited. Let me get straight to my speech. My topic is macro strategic trends in the Indo Pacific. Now, the term macro strategic is not one in general use in international relations. Actually, I made it up when thinking about what to talk to you about. So perhaps I should start with a brief definition. In economics, macroeconomics deals with the overall behavior and performance of an economy. Macro strategic, as I use the term, refers to those broad factors that determines the overall strategic environment that shapes and conditions the dynamics of specific issues, such as North Korea or Taiwan or maritime disputes in the East and South China Seas. It's a very clumsy term, and I apologize for not being able to think of a better way of describing what I had in mind. But in my view, there are three such macro strategic factors that will have a profound impact on the stability of that vast region we now call the Indo-Pacific. And these three factors are, first, changes in the structure of international relations for which the term Indo-Pacific is itself a convenient metaphor. Second, changes in the behavior of the two key actors in the Indo-Pacific, the US and China. And third, the responses of other key states to these changes in American and Chinese behavior, and in particular, Japan, India, South Korea, Australia, and the ASEAN. ASEAN member states, and their, their responses will influence the evolution of the future regional architecture. These, effect, these factors will assert a profound influence on the overall strategic environment for the foreseeable future. In other words, I think this is something that we will have to live with for decades and not just a few years. And I'll deal with the three factors before concluding by very briefly discussing the three specific issues I mentioned earlier, North Korea, Taiwan, and the maritime disputes in the East and South China Seas, which I see as two manifestations of a common phenomenon. And as time is limited, I'll make my argument in very broad strokes and leave details to question time. So with your permission, let me begin. About seven years ago, I published a book entitled Dealing with an Ambiguous World in which I observed that ours was an age without definition. 30 years after the end of the Cold War, we had no better way of describing our era than by reference to the era that preceded it. We could only call our, our times the post-Cold War. Are we now better able to define the post-Cold War strategic environment and formulate coherent strategies for it? I don't think we are really better prepared, but I think we are now beginning to have a better glimpse of the broad contours of our times. 
Ideas like the Indo-Pacific are perhaps best still understood as metaphors that seek in a tentative and imperfect way to grasp new geopolitical realities that are still in the process of definition and malleable, rather than precise concepts whose meaning commands general agreement. And insofar as their advocates try to persuade others to accept these new metaphors, there are also attempts at shaping those realities. China's Belt and Road Initiative is another example. The term Indo-Pacific has a Rashomon-like quality after the name of the famous movie by the great Japanese director, Akira Kurosawa. And this is perhaps appropriate since the origins of the term Indo-Pacific can be traced back to speeches given in 2007 by the late Shinzo Abe during his first term as prime minister and also Asotaro, who was then foreign minister. In any case, while the term Indo-Pacific has now gained white currency, there is still no single idea of the Indo-Pacific. Japan, the US, India, South Korea, Australia, the EU, and ASEAN all have their own perspectives on the Indo-Pacific, which overlap but are not identical. What all versions of the Indo-Pacific have very loosely in common is first the recognition that geography is not is always politically and not just physically defined, and the separation of the Pacific and Indian Oceans and India from East Asia had become strategically artificial. Secondly, it is clear that some degree of concern over certain aspects of Chinese behavior underlie the idea of the Indo-Pacific. But these common aspects are themselves not without ambiguity. The US, Japan, India, South Korea, Australia, the EU, and ASEAN do not have exactly the same concerns about China, do not hold their concerns with the same intensity, and are still trying to reconcile these concerns with other interests, including their continuing interest in political and economic engagement with China. However deep their concerns about China, no country, not even the US and its closest allies, is ever going to shun China. And today it is difficult to characterize any relationship with China as clearly that between friend or foe. And attitudes towards China do not exhaust the ambiguities of the Indo-Pacific. Even the attitudes of members of former American alliances, as well as those of partners like India and ASEAN, are not without their own ambiguities. For example, does a free and open Indo-Pacific refer only to economics and trade? Or is it also political? If political, is it only applicable to international relationships? Or can it, should it, also claim a domestic component? Insofar as it refers to economics and trade, is it, can it be confined to freedom of navigation? Or does it at least imply a commitment to trade liberalization? Or is it both economic and political? And if it is both, what relative priority is to be placed on its political and economic meanings? and its international and domestic components? And are these priorities fixed or are they fluid and contingent on circumstances? Does everyone who uses the phrase free and open Indo-Pacific, or for that matter, rules-based order, agree on all these complexities? And does acceptance of one meaning of the Indo-Pacific commit you to accept other meanings? And even the physical geography is not without ambiguities. Where are the western boundaries of the Indo-Pacific? The west coast of India, the east coast of Africa, the Persian Gulf, or is it just a means of emphasizing interdependence and the connectivity of the oceans? The term Indo-Pacific is, is a useful metaphor for what I consider structural changes in the international system, precisely because these ambiguities of boundaries and meaning are themselves a reflection of a deeper phenomenon. A few years ago, there was a slew of articles and comments by both academics and practitioners on some aspect of the theme of the return of great power competition. This was a reaction to US-China competition and the war in Ukraine, and signified the burial of the foolish delusion that the end of the Cold War and the implosion of the Soviet Union signified an end to history. This was understandable as such, but nevertheless puzzled me. Return. When did great power competition ever go away? 
Competition and conflict are inherent characteristics of international relations between sovereign states and perhaps of human nature too. It was only a historically short and exceptional period of about 20 years after the Berlin Wall came down when this harsh reality was masked by the overwhelming dominance of the US. That period is over and it will not be recreated. What US-China strategic competition and the war in Ukraine signify is not so much a return of great power competition as a return to normalcy. This is not to say that nothing has changed or that there is nothing new under the sun. Posting, focusing only on particularities, US-China relations, Taiwan, North Korea, maritime disputes, Ukraine, Gaza war, among others, but focusing on this, only on these specifics, risk missing the woods for the trees and ignoring significant change in the context of these specific contests and conflicts. Let me illustrate this by reference to US-China competition. Now, one of the most misleading, although unfortunately common ways of describing our times and US-China strategic competition is to call it a new Cold War. This is an inappropriate historical analogy. The Cold War competition between the US and the Soviet Union was between two separate systems, connected only at their margins. But the essential purpose of US Soviet competition was to determine which was the superior way of organizing modern industrial society. The expectation, which proved correct, was that ultimately one would prevail. In this sense, it was an existential competition to see which would replace the other, even after nuclear deterrence made direct confrontation between principles too dangerous and the conflicts were between proxies. And that is what then Prime Minister Khrushchev men, when he told a group of Western, no, General Secretary Khrushchev men, when he told a group of Western ambassadors in 1956, we will bury you. He didn't mean it literally. He meant that he believed his system would betray, be, prevail. Of course, he was wrong. But the US and China, by contrast, are both essential components of a single global system. And they are linked to each other and the rest of us by a historically new phenomenon. And that phenomenon is a web of supply chains of a scope, of a density, and of a complexity never before seen in history. Countries in the Indo-Pacific occupy important nodes in this web and are poised to become even more important in it. This web is what distinguishes 21st century interdependence from earlier periods of interdependence. Russia is less integrated into this global web and less integrated into the Indo-Pacific than China, but it too is part of it and occupies key niches, as for example, the disruptions to agriculture and food supplies occasioned by the sanctions imposed on Moscow have revealed. Now, I don't think there was much choice but to impose sanctions of the Feb after the February 2020 invasion of Ukraine, as it was such an egregious violation of fundamental norms. But I think we all underestimated the extent of the disruptions they caused. Russia is a relatively minor part of the world economy, about the size of Italy or South Korea. So imagine the disruptions if any attempt to cut off the second largest world economy are made, is made. It's just not a practical proposition. Now, there has been partial bifurcation due to US-China strategic competition, partial bifurcation of this global web in specific domains, mainly those connected to high technology. Undoubtedly, there will be more disruptions to come. But in my judgment, it is highly improbable that this dense and complex web of supply chains will unravel to any significant extent, let alone bifurcate into two separate systems as had existed between the US and the Soviet Union. Unless China makes a mistake on the scale of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I don't think anyone will be foolish enough to try and, e to try and even impose this same kind of sanctions on China, and even if they try, can succeed. Now, another way of stating the same point I have been making is to say that while globalization has certainly slowed down, 
and become patchy, scenarios of globalization being reversed are highly improbable. Both the US and China are uncomfortable with their interdependence because it, imposes, it exposes their vulnerabilities. They have tried to mitigate their vulnerabilities, the US and its allies, by trying to reduce China's role in critical supply chains and cutting China off from key technologies. And China by trying to become more self-reliant in key technologies and relying more on domestic consumption to drive growth. But I think neither will succeed, at least not to the extent they may hope. Both strategies, de-risking supply chains and self-reliance, are easier said than done. And to the extent they are practical, will take a long time to have any significant effect. In 2022, the total volume of US-China trade, despite all the restrictions the US had imposed, was 690 billion US dollars. Last year, 2023, it was 664 billion US dollars. This is a reduction, but still the total volume is not inconsequential and does not indicate any significant decoupling. Furthermore, the reduction is probably due more to structural weaknesses in the Chinese domestic economy and slower growth than to any geopolitical factor. Geopolitics may have accentuated these domestic structural weaknesses, but did not create them. Consequently, while the US will continue and China will continue to compete, and will compete robustly, their competition is not between systems as existed between the US and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, but rather within the system of which they are both vital parts. The dynamics of competition within a system are fundamentally different from competition between systems. This is a crucial point that we should not overlook as we analyze specific issues or decide how to position ourselves in the new strategic environment. Uh, what's the difference between competition between systems and competition within a system? For a start, competition within a system is complex, not binary, as during the US-Soviet Cold War. That is why no Indo-Pacific country, not even the closest US ally, in fact, no country anywhere, is ever going to cut itself off from China, or for that matter, Russia. Regardless of what concerns we may have about Beijing or Moscow's behavior, this is simply impractical. By the same token, not even countries very dependent on China, Laos, for example, are ever going to cut themselves off from the West. The only partial exception in the Pacific is perhaps Myanmar, and that is as much due to Western choices as Myanmar's own choices. More crucially, unlike US-Soviet Cold War competition, US-China competition is not and cannot be existential. It cannot be existential because its purpose is not for one system to replace an, another as during the US-Soviet competition, but to use the interdependency of competition within a system to gain advantage over rivals. The, may, the US may want to use these interdependencies to retain its dominance over the system, and the Chinese may want to use these interdependencies to replace the US at the apex of the system. But those are entirely different matters and than wanting to replace the entire system. And as I've previously stated, I don't think either is going to succeed. And, and, and it is very unlikely to result in any clear-cut denouement as the binary US-Soviet competition. The complex dynamics and limitations imposed by the hard economic realities of competition within a system cannot be glossed over by trying to impose simplistic binary frameworks on them, whether by framing the competition as between democracy and authoritarianism, both by the way are protean terms with many variants, or the grandiose and historically inaccurate Chinese claim to have found a path to modernize without westernization. I'll elaborate on the fallacies of the Chinese claim later because while it is fundamentally flawed, it is nevertheless not inconsequential, at least in its intent. Now, the new strategic environment, which I've just described, has led to important changes in the behaviors of the US and China. Let me start with the US. After the Cold War, the US faces no existential threat anywhere in the world. 
There is no existential threat to the US of the nature posed by the Soviet Union anywhere in the world. Russia is a very dangerous adversary, but even before the Ukraine war, its long-term trajectory was downward for economic and demographic reasons. Putin's miscalculation in Ukraine has probably hastened that trajectory. After the initial shock of 9-11, it has become clear that in the subsequent 20 odd years, that terrorism, while state, whether state sponsored or by non state actors, is certainly very dangerous, but is not an existential state threat to any well constituted state, and certainly not to the United States. China is a formidable peer competitor. China's economy is far more viable than the Soviet economy ever was, and far stronger than the post Soviet Russian economy. But is China an existential threat? Is it really in Beijing's interest to replace the existing system with its own system, even assuming it has the ability to do so, which is doubtful given the very serious structural problems that confront the Chinese economy? China is a, possibly the, major beneficiary, beneficiary of the post-Cold War global economy. Beijing may want to displace the US from the center of the global economy and dominate it. But that is a different matter from wanting to kick over the table and seek radically new arrangements. China's behavior in the East and South China Seas and in the Himalayas is certainly assertive, assertively and sometimes aggressively revanches. But to call it revisionist or systemic competitor is to overstate the case. Revanchism is not the same thing as revisionism. Without an existential, existential threat, there is no longer any strong reason for Americans to bear any burden or pay any price to uphold international order. The key priorities of every post-Cold War American administration have been domestic, with George W. Bush's administration an exception forced by 9-11, which led his administration into ill-advised adventures in the Middle East. Since then, every American president has tried to rectify Bush's mistakes by disengaging from his Middle Eastern engagements, but with limited sub success until President Biden finally cut the Gordian knot in Afghanistan in 2021. That ruthlessly decisive move and the domestic focus of all post-Cold War administrations has often been misrepresented as America retreating from the world. But it is more accurately understood as America redefining the terms of its engagement with the world. Half a century ago, the US corrected the mistake it had made in Vietnam by withdrawing from direct intervention on the mainland of Southeast Asia to maintain stability throughout East Asia by assuming the role instead of an offshore balancer relying primarily on naval and air power. And it has been remarkably consistent in that role in East Asia ever since for 50 years. After the withdrawal from Afghanistan, a shift to an analogous role is, as offshore balancer is now occurring in the Middle East, where the US is very unlikely to again intervene with large scale ground forces. But the U.S. Fifth Fleet is still in Bahrain, and the U.S. Air Force is still in Qatar and the UAE. And U.S. behavior during the current Gaza war, which, which saw its deployment of aircraft carriers and a nuclear and a cruise missiles armed nuclear submarine to the Gulf, is typical of an offshore balancer. And sooner or later, a similar shift will occur in Europe too, delayed but not diverted by the war in Ukraine. Now, an offshore balancer is not in retreat, <coughs> but an offshore balancer defines its interests more narrowly and demands more of its allies, its partners, and friends to help it maintain order and balance. With the Obama administration, this took the form of an emphasis on multilateralism, which essentially is a form of burden sharing. Donald Trump made unilateral and crudely transactional demands. President Biden is consultative, but he does not consult allies, partners, and friends 
merely for the pleasure of their company. He consults you to ascertain what you are prepared to do to help meet strategies. He consults you only to ascertain what you are prepared to do to help meet America's strategic concerns. For those that meet his expectations, President Biden seems willing to go further than any of his predecessors to provide them with the tools to further common strategic aims. And this is the meaning of AUKUS, enabling Australia to acquire nuclear powered submarines. This is the first time in more than 60 years that the US has shared such technology. In this sense, President Biden's consultative approach is a politer form of Trump's crude transactionalism. If you do not meet expectations, the Biden administration will probably still be polite, but you should not expect to be taken too seriously. The shift to a more transactional American foreign policy is, I think, permanent. Of all leaders in the Indo-Pacific, the late Shinzo Abe understood this best, and he significantly enhanced Japan's ability to contribute to the U.S. alliance during his second term as prime minister. Other U.S. allies, partners and friends in ASEAN, in the Middle East, and most of all, in Europe, were slower to accept this new reality. Some are only beginning to grapple with it. All debates about America's reliability have resurfaced and given a sharper edge, and been given a sharper edge by the US presidential election that will be held at the end of this year. Given the Central American role, the crucial American role in the Indo-Pacific, such debates reflect anxieties which are understandable but are nevertheless beside the point. The wars in Ukraine and Gaza have underscored the vital and irreplaceable American role in maintaining regional balances at a time when China's behavior towards Taiwan in the East and South China Seas and the Himalayas, its, its unwillingness to distance itself from Russian aggression and Hamas, its often predatory economic practices has, uh, have aroused concerns across the region. There is only one America, and since there is no way to maintain balance in the Indo-Pacific without the US, rather than engaging in futile angst about American reliability, every country must decide for itself what it is prepared to do or not to do with the US to help it maintain balance and how best to do whatever they are prepared to do. In fact, Quiet but significant shifts in attitudes towards the US are already underway. I have mentioned the changes that Mr. Abe had made in Japan's defense and strategic posture. India has abandoned its traditional purist notions of non-alignment. And in Southeast Asia, there is now a better appreciation that Singapore's support for maintaining a US military presence by opening some of our facilities to US forces is a regional common good and key ASEAN member states are themselves improving their bilateral defense ties with the US. Details of this shift of attitude during question time for those who are interested. These shifts have not erased anxieties about US reliability. The anxieties arise precisely because of the better appreciation of Americans, America's indispensability in maintaining balance in Southeast Asia. But this shift should not be ignored either. It is in the interest of middle power US allies like Japan to consider how they can help sustain the shift of attitudes in Southeast Asia at a time when the trajectory of US domestic politics has enhanced, has enhanced the anxieties. Now China. I have already referred in passing to China's assertive and sometimes aggressive revanchist behavior over Taiwan and the East and South China Seas and in the Himalayas. Now, assertion and indeed aggression are in themselves nothing new in international relations generally or to China specifically. During the 1950s down to the early 1980s, China supported communist insurgencies in Southeast Asia. Beijing still maintains discrete arms length ties with various 
largely ethnic-based insurgencies in Northeast India and along its borders with Myanmar. What is crucial and unique about the revanchist claims Beijing makes over Taiwan, the East and South China Seas and the Himalayas and distinguishes them from Beijing's support for ethnic insurgencies and other territorial disputes within, between states, which are after all not uncommon in international relations. For example, the dispute between Japan and South Korea over the islands or rocks the Koreans call Dokto and the Chinese and the Japanese Takeshima. What's different is that China's claims in the South and East China Seas over Taiwan and the Himalayas are directly linked to the nationalist historical narrative of humiliation, rejuvenation, and attaining the China dream by which the Chinese Communist Party now legitimates its right to rule. Since the late Qing Dynasty in the 19th century, the legitimacy of every Chinese government, whether imperial, republican, or communist, has been judged by its ability to defend China's sovereignty and territorial integrity. The Chinese Communist Party has been the most successful in this regard, but there is nothing particularly unique about its nationalist narrative of humiliation, rejuvenation, and achieving the Chinese dream. The Kuomintang under Chiang Kai-shek used essentially the same narrative, and the Chinese Communist Party referred to it even before it took power in 1949. But, and it's a big but, but until up to the early 2020, early 2000s, when private entrepreneurs, in other words, capitalists, were allowed to join the Chinese Communist Party, this nationalist narrative was tempered by the more orthodox communist narrative of class struggle. But after economic reforms, which led to China's integration into the market-oriented, in other words, capitalist world economy, and with capitalists joining the Chinese Communist Party, class struggle lost all credibility as a source of legitimacy. The Chinese Communist Party began to rely more and more on nationalism to legitimize its right to rule and monopoly of control. Economic performance is an important supplement to this nationalist narrative, but cannot be a substitute for it. After all, economic growth can occur under many types of political system, whereas it's a historical fact that the CCP has given has been the most successful of all the types of regimes that have governed China since the late 19th century, in not only securing Chinese borders, but ensuring a better life for the Chinese people. Xi Jinping has used the nationalist narrative of humiliation, rejuvenation, and achieving the China dream much more insistently than any previous Chinese leader, and has coupled it with a stronger assertion of party control over state, society, and the economy. The nationalist narrative gives a special quality to China's territorial claims. It, lim it limits the scope for maneuver of Chinese foreign policy, making it well nigh impossible to make genuine compromises and injects a strong element of entitlement into Chinese foreign policy. After all, if I am only reclaiming what was taken from me when I was weak, why should I compromise except temporarily and tactically? And if I am only reclaiming what is rightfully mine, how can I compromise, let alone settle these disputes without appearing weak to my own people? Indeed, since it is mine, I must be assertive in claiming my rights. Maintaining its rule and monopoly of power is the most vital of the Chinese Communist Party's interests, the core of its core interests. And to some extent, it is a prisoner of its own narrative. Furthermore, this nationalist narrative is a very Chinese narrative of limited appeal globally and even limited in its appeal to overseas Chinese communities who have their own dreams. The assertive behavior hardwired into the Chinese Communist Party's legitimating narrative and its limited appeal are key reasons for China's less than stellar geopolitical position in the Indo-Pacific. Of course, as previously mentioned, 
China will never be shunned and is a geopolitical fact that we must all always deal with. But in that vast swath of countries from Northeast Asia through Southeast Asia to South Asia, which are the countries China can really rely on? Who can China really rely on? Perhaps North Korea, Laos, Cambodia, maybe Nepal, the Maldives, certainly Pakistan. But this is not a very inspiring collection. And arguably, these countries are as much liabilities as assets, and they are not without their own internal anxieties about China. By contrast, there is the Quad, AUKUS, the revitalization of American alliances, and as previously mentioned, quiet but significant changes in the attitudes of key ASEAN members towards US military presence in Southeast Asia and defense cooperation with the US. To broaden its appeal, particularly in what we now call the Global South, is perhaps why Beijing claims that it offers an alternative to the Western model of development. Now, before he suddenly disappeared, former Foreign Minister Qin Kang had boasted that China had, and I quote, shattered the myth that modernization is westernization, a claim that also underpins Xi Jinping's Global Civilization Initiative. But this claim is at best only partially true. The myth was shattered long ago and not by China. China's general development trajectory is not essentially different from that of Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Indonesia, India, or any other country that has successfully modernized and developed. Modernization has always necessarily entailed westernization. Westernization is spelled with a lower case, W, and never westernization spelled with an uppercase W, because it had always involved adapting the ideas and techniques of modern industrial society to local conditions. And until Japan developed after the Meiji Restoration, all modern industrial societies were Western. That's just a historical fact. The only choice was to adapt from the US European model, which stressed the market and democracy based on individual rights, or to adapt from the Soviet Russian model, which emphasized the planned economy and people's democracy in which the individual is subordinated to the Vanguard party. China chose the latter. But communism is not an ancient Chinese philosophy, and the Vanguard party, party was not invented by some ancient Chinese emperor. Adding the phrase, the phrase with Chinese characteristics to the Chinese system cannot erase the strong Western influence on China since 1911, and which continued under 1940, after 1949. Whatever the choice, whether you chose the Western model or the Soviet model, there were always national particularities and successful adaptations have never been mere carbon copies of either the model. China is only a specific case of a general phenomenon and unique only in the trite sense that every country is unique. The claim that there is a uniquely Chinese model is hollow and will also, in my view, be of limited appeal, appealing to the mood in the global south rather than hard interests, if there is a global south. And that's something we can discuss later. And insofar as it resonates with this mood, is of limited applicability because it rests on the foundation of a communist state or a Leninist state, of which there are only four other surviving examples, other than China, Vietnam, Laos, North Korea, and Cuba. The days when anyone could seriously hope or fear that communism was the future are long over. China faces serious structural issues that have led to a loss of confidence and slower growth. The Chinese model lost a lot, lost much of its luster during the first decade of Xi Jinping's rule. Since Xi's decisions were the essential cause of the issues China now confronts, the prospects for any but tactical adjustments of direction in the next 10 to 15 years that Xi may remain in power are not high. And by mid-century or thereabouts, demographics will further slow growth. Now, don't misunderstand me. China will not collapse 
the Chinese Communist Party is an extremely adaptable organization, but with, but with maintaining control as its primary value and core interest, the Chinese Communist Party is likely to opt for suboptimal economic solutions. Now, whether that will be sufficient to satisfy China's external ambitions and domestic expectations are questions only time can answer. And if insufficient, only time will tell how a frustrated and highly nationalistic China will behave. Let me now turn to the key to the responses of key Indo-Pacific states. I earlier mentioned Japan, South Korea, India, Australia, and ASEAN member states. There are, of course, important national differences in, the, in their responses. But in the interest of time, let me deal with what they all have in common. We are all confronted with two fundamental strategic realities. First, the US and China are geopolitical facts that no country can ignore, and we must deal with both in order to deal with either effectively. Second, there are concerns about both American and Chinese behavior. Faced with these realities, the immediate response, in fact, the general response to date of most countries driven by their anxieties about China, has led to a re revitalization of the US alliance system and efforts by India and key ASEAN members to improve defense relations and security cooperation with the US. But unless there is a fundamental reorientation of the direction of US domestic politics or a fundamental change in Chinese policies, both of which I think are unlikely, in the longer run, most countries are going to hedge by trying to maximize strategic flexibility within the constraints of their specific circumstances. No country anywhere, even former US allies or those economically dependent on China, will want to align all their interests across all domains in one direction or another. They will try to align different interests in different domains in the most advantageous direction. And since all countries face the same imperative, no country's choices need to be confined to only the US or China. The US may be the most important actors, but they are not the only potential partners. What I see evolving in the Indo-Pacific as the 21st century progresses is what I call a system of dynamic multipolarity. The US-China relationship will be the main axis around which eclectic groups or countries will continually form, dissolve and reconstitute themselves in different coalitions on different issues as their interests dictate. Each coalition will have different participants and leaders. Some may include both the US and China, some one or the other, and some neither. These ever-shifting coalitions will not displace existing alliances, institutions and forums but will form an overlay that shapes their dynamics and, and in turn be shaped by them. The Indo-Pacific regional architecture will not be a single structure, but one of multiple overlying frameworks, overlapping frameworks. There are several developments that already point in that direction. Japan taking the initiative to form the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, after the Trump administration renounced the TPP. India's concerns about China leading it to join the Quad. But those concerns did not prevent India from joining the China-led Shanghai Cooperation Organization. China left, India left the ASEAN-led RCEP, but along with the US, China and Russia, among others, is part of other ASEAN-initiated forums, such as the East Asia Summit, and the ASEAN Defense Ministers Plus meeting. The Indo-Pacific is a diverse region, and diversity makes it a naturally multipolar region. Since the Indo-Pacific is also the epicenter of the broad shifts driving dynamic multipolarity, the rise of China and India, the pervasive influence of US-China competition, and the region's increasingly important role in the global web of supply chains, among others, the Indo-Pacific will be the test bed for the emerging new architecture, which I believe will eventually spread to other geographic regions. Such a fluid and multifaceted system cannot be geographically constrained. Again, there are early signs. Australia, Japan, and South Korea have attended the NATO summit. The UK has joined the CPTPP, 
in March last year. And in the Middle East, or more accurately, the Western Indo-Pacific, the I2U2 brings together India, Israel, the UAE, and the US, underscoring the blurring of conventional geographic boundaries in the evolving strategic environment. The key question is whether such a fluid system will be stable. Well, my short answer is I think it can be stable, but it will require us to think of stability in dynamic and not static terms. We should not, we should again not mistake the historically that historically short and exceptional period when there were there seemed to be no alternative to American ideas of international order as the norm. That that was beneficial to most of us does not make it any less exceptional or replicable. It is a fundamental mistake, I think, to, to conceive of any international order as necessarily uncontested or even peaceful. Historically, it was more often than not the contest and the parameters of the contest that defined the, that order. That was certainly true for the 40 or so years after the Second World War. It was messy, often dangerous, as Cold War competition between the US and Soviet Union became entangled with decolonization and its aftershocks, but it was the only order we had. And during those 40 years, the major powers avoided war for a simple, if politically unpalatable fact. Nuclear deterrence and the fear of mutually assured destruction. Morally ambivalent as peace based on fear may be, it is nevertheless the only practical means of preventing conflict between nuclear armed states. The nuclear Pandora's box was opened over Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, and there is no way to put the demons then released back into it. Nuclear disarmament is a, is a, is a delusion, and one of the casualties of the Ukraine war was the further weakening of the non-proliferation regime. The balance of terror kept what one scholar has termed the long peace between the US and the Soviet Union, and I think it will prevent direct conflict between the US and China, as it is preventing direct conflict between Russia and NATO over the war in Ukraine. The main risk between the US and China is not war by design, that is to say resort to war as an instrument of policy, but an accident or miscalculation getting out of hand driven by the domestic politics of both sides. Recent US-China contacts have not resolved fundamental issues. Relations may remain, remain fragile, but the resumption of military-to-military -military contacts can mitigate the risk of accidental escalation, particularly since the resumption of dialogue at least indicates that neither side is spoiling for a fight, even as they continue to compete. The nuclear dimension in the, of the Indo-Pacific is understudied, and insofar as it has been studied, my impression is, is that the focus has generally been on national nuclear strategies rather than its impact on, on the dynamics of the region as a whole. Yet since 1945, nuclear deterrence has been the single most important influence on global politics and strategy. With this in mind, let me conclude with some thoughts on the maritime disputes, North Korea and Taiwan. Again, in the interest of time, I will focus on what these three issues have in common. All three connect to Chinese domestic politics, although not with the same degree of importance or in exactly the same way. And all three connect in different ways to China's nuclear strategy. First, politics. Maritime disputes in the East and South China Seas and Taiwan intersect with the Chinese Communist Party, Party's legitimating narrative of humiliation, rejuvenation, and achieving the China dream. The maritime disputes tangentially and Taiwan more directly and crucially. Xi Jinping has on several occasions made clear that the China dream cannot be achieved without reunification. Politically, the maritime disputes in the East and South China Seas are useful because China's claims and assertions of sovereignty 
over these tiny islands, whether real or artificial, these tiny islands, rocks and shoals, through naval and coast guard deployments, allows Beijing to put some flesh on the bare bones of his legitimating narrative and posture for the edification of his own people without undue risk. This, this is not to say there is no risk, but they are manageable precisely because war over these specks in the ocean would be absurd. American treaty commitments to Japan and regular freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea ensure that these maritime disputes are stalemates. China will never give up its claims, let alone dig up the artificial islands it has created in the South China Sea and throw the sand back into the sea. Eventually, it will permanently deploy military assets on them. But neither can China deter Japan and the US and, a, and an expanding group of American allies from operating in, through, and over these waters without risking war. This is not ideal, but it's good enough given the circumstances. Taiwan is a different matter. China has consistently mishandled the situation over Taiwan, as the results of this weekend's elections have again shown. A separate Chinese identity has developed and can only grow stronger over time. There is very little support in Taiwan for reunification, and this will dwindle even more over time. The Chinese Communist Party's increasing control over China's private sector has lessened the attraction of China's economy, while its treatment of Hong Kong has stripped the idea of one country, two systems of all credibility. In effect, China has already lost Taiwan. Now, this does not mean that war over Taiwan is inevitable. In fact, while China will never give up the military option and will continue preparing for it, I don't think the use of force is China's preferred option. China has neither the capability nor the experience to launch an amphibious operation on the scale that would be required. Now, capability can and is being built, but the fact is no one, no one anywhere in the world has had the experience of conducting such large-scale amphibious operations ever since the Incheon landing in 1950, or perhaps even ever since the Normandy landings during World War II. So, to try to capture Taiwan by force will be an immense gamble, and no Chinese leader can survive failure, and precisely because of the close nexus between the reunification, between reunification and the Chinese Communist Party's legitimating narrative, even the roots of party rule could be shaken by a botched operation. So I don't think they are eager to gamble. There are, there are scenarios in which China must fight even if it will lose, but fortunately those are not very probable scenarios. I will elaborate during question time if anyone is interested. Now, the implication of all this is that the Taiwan issue is something like a chronic disease for which there is no cure, but must be managed and can be managed by diplomacy and deterrence over the long term. Finally, and very briefly, let me talk about nuclear strategy, the connection of these three issues to nuclear strategy. And I'll deal with North Korea in this context. China has been a nuclear power since 1964, but until recently, its second strike capability was rudimentary, its survivability questionable, and hence not very credible. China is now modernizing its nuclear forces at a feverish pace and recently deployed a new generation submarine launch ballistic missile, the JL-3, that can reach the continental US from bastion waters in the South China Sea and, Bo and the Bohai Gulf. Chinese submarines previously had to navigate through the two island chains from the Kuril Islands down to Southeast Asia in order to reach the US with its earlier generation submarine launch ballistic missiles, which made them very vulnerable. And this is the strategic significance of Chinese claims in the East and South China Seas. But the modernization of China's nuclear forces, and I don't think anyone should take false comfort from recent reports of corruption in the highest echelons of the PLA's rocket forces and stories about faulty launch hatches and missiles filled with water rather than fuel. These are only temporary setbacks. 
I don't think anybody should take false comfort from these things because the modernization of China's nuclear forces and its creation of a, of a credible second site capability raises very, very fundamental issues. China's nuclear weapon and ICBM programs raises similar issues. I don't think Pyongyang can be either incentivized or coerced into giving up these programs. Denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula in any of the meanings of that phrase, denuclearization, is a chimera, a mythical creature. It doesn't exist. To Pyongyang, these programs are existential issues of regime survival. And there is no cost high enough and no incentive attractive enough to deter or persuade the current Korean, North Korean leadership to abandon them. It would take regime change to do so. And in the minds of the current North Korean leadership, I think giving up these programs is tantamount to regime change. We should not overestimate China's influence over North Korea or misunderstand China's calculation. Beijing is not enthusiastic about North Korea's nuclear weapon and ICM, ICBM programs. In fact, I know for a fact they don't like it. But it has a strong, indeed vital interest in the North Korean regime's survival. As previously mentioned, North Korea is one of only five remaining communist systems. And Beijing cannot, be even, cannot even be tacitly complicit in regime change in any of them without risking dangerously inconvenient questions about the Chinese Communist Party itself arising in the minds of its own people. Although their relationship is fraught with mutual mistrust, China simply cannot afford to let North Korea die. Tolerating a nuclear North Korea is the least bad option for Beijing. So we will all have to live with a nuclear North Korea and a China that steadily improves their second strike capabilities. As China and North Korea become able to credibly threaten the continental US, two fundamental issues must be confronted by US allies in the Indo-Pacific. First, by those in Northeast Asia, Japan and South, Korea, South Korea, and in due course by Australia too. First, what is the future of American extended deterrence? Or to put it in a more concrete way, will San Francisco or Los Angeles be sacrificed to save Tokyo or Seoul or Sydney? And second, can a nuclear weapon state be credibly deterred by a non-nuclear weapon state? Japan and South Korea have started bilateral consultations with the US over extended deterrence. Such consultations are useful and necessary, but they are palliatives that do not get to the heart of these two fundamental questions. Similar questions were asked in Europe by France and the UK decades ago, after the Soviet Union acquired nuclear weapons in 1949. I think the inherent logic of circumstances will lead Japan and South Korea to eventually however reluctantly and painfully, come to similar conclusions as France and the UK. In any case, it's not something that institutions like GRIPS can or should avoid thinking about. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for listening to me so patiently. I've probably spoken for too long, but I'm now happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bilahali. It was a great, inspiring speech. And then uh, you gave us a very important uh, kind of homework to think harder. 